Hey everyone, and welcome to this webinar on integrating serverless WebAssembly with SpinCube and some cloud services. My name is Sohan Maheshwar. I'm a dev advocate at Fermion, and we have Thorsten here as well. My name now. That's true. Do it again. <laughs> do it, again. <laughs> it was a. I Sorry. thought you would just pause. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I'll just I'll, I'll introduce myself and I'll pause. You introduce yourself. Yeah. And then I'll talk about the abstract and we'll dive straight in, right? Okay, good. Yeah. Hey everyone, welcome to the CNCF webinar on integrating serverless WebAssembly with SpinCube and cloud services. My name is Sohan Maheshwar. I'm a dev advocate at Fermion. My name is Thorsten Hans. I'm also a dev advocate at Fermion. So today we are going to show you how you can run serverless WebAssembly workloads on Azure Kubernetes Service or AKS. Uh, and essentially we're going to run this next to your containerized applications using this open source project called SpinCube. Now, if none of this makes sense to you, or if you're already familiar, no problem. We are going to dive straight into talking about each of these right now. So Thorsten, let's take it away. Yeah, cool. So let's bring up my screen. Um... There we go. Um, so what we've prepared for today is a pretty common Azure infrastructure. And let me quickly uh, highlight a couple of things. So this is not the uh, entire footprint of the infrastructure. It's just the most important parts that we will look at today. So as a developer, we will use the Spin CLI to craft our WebAssembly workloads, right? And we can package and distribute them as OCI artifacts. So meaning we can store them in a Docker registry 2.0 compliant uh, container registry. And the Azure container registry is obviously one that implements that standard. Then we use cloud-based uh, identity to make our Kubernetes cluster pull those OCI artifacts and ultimately run our spin app next beside the containerized workloads that may be already there. Um, so the Kubernetes cluster itself is integrated with a private virtual network in the cloud. Um, we have a dedicated subnet for the Kubernetes worker nodes and a subnet for pods, meaning for the containerized workloads or for the WebAssembly workloads. Um, on top of that, we have an additional subnet called backend where we integrate other pass services using Azure private endpoints, which is basically a mechanism to um, cut off public network access to our instances of those pass services. So today we're looking into Azure Cache for Redis as a fully managed uh, Redis uh, service and uh, Azure Flexible Server for MySQL to have like a persistence layer as well. So both services will own, are only available in our private virtual network. And uh, we register private DNS zones to make our spin app resolve the actual host name to a private IP address, which will be dynamically assigned. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the idea. Um, we want to be fully transparent, right? It's not a production grade uh, environment. Um, obviously, you could would harden all infrastructure artifacts or bits a little bit more, uh, but it's um, let's say it's almost on the way <laughs> yeah. to to be production grade. But it's it's um, there, right? In the in yeah. the sense that, uh, of course, we have simplified it for this demo. But yeah. all the all the bells and whistles, if you will, of a production grade workload are there here. So yeah, I mean, yeah. You, you could use this in, in a production environment as well. Yeah, with a couple of, you know, yeah. extensions, extensions and tweaks. Yeah, and, yeah <laughs> let's say it that way. Um, so let's let's have a look at the at the Azure portal over here. Um, I just want to briefly highlight a couple of services which are interested for the sake of this demonstration. So obviously, we have the Kubernetes cluster. Um, but the idea is to, to you know, demonstrate that we can build a real world uh, applications using Spin WebAssembly and have SpinCube running them on Kubernetes. So the idea is how to interact with, for example, um, Azure Cache for Redis, which is this one, 
and it is a regular pass service, right? So by default, it's accessible by our uh, full qualified domain name, um, but due to the network connectivity using the private endpoint, we have disabled. So this is a, like a toggle button, right? So uh, right now, public network access is disabled. So we are no one is able to interact with that instance from outside of our virtual network. The Azure private endpoint although is over here. And as you can see, it's integrated with our uh, virtual network in the subnet backend that we saw earlier on the on that diagram. And the same, the same applies for the MySQL flexible server. So if you go to that one, uh, the UI looks a little bit different. So we have a networking tab over there. And as you can see, this box is unchecked, so there is no public network access uh, allowed for the MySQL database as well. And there's also a private endpoint, which is again integrated into the backend subnet. All right, so this was like, you know, a brief uh, look into the infrastructure, maybe one one last uh, thing is the container registry so that's just you know a default container registry but it's capable of storing all kinds of oci artifacts so if we go to um to the repositories we have uh, cache with redis that are the you know versions i already created of my spin app and we will add a new version later in this in this webinar and have AKS or Kubernetes pull it from there using Azure-based identity. All right, so let's move over to uh, VS Code and let's have a look at the spin app. So um, for sake of demonstration, I created an HTTP API using one of the HTTP templates provided by spin. And I decided to go with Tiny go. So <laughs> um, for each and every request hitting the spin app, we use the uh, spin router to expose different endpoints, right? So it's a full fledged CRUD API. But I think we will look into uh, receiving all items and the convenient handler down here to invalidate the cache from mm -hmm. outside. Although all handlers, you know, as as soon as a request modifies data that could be potentially cached, uh, it invalidates the cache, right? Mm -hmm. So a common like transparent cache implementation for an HTTP API. But let's jump right into get items over here. And let me walk you quickly through the uh, thought process or the process of how a request is handled. So for receiving all items, we first look into the cache, if the cache has already all items in cache. Um, if it is a cache hit, so if the items are already in cache, we don't have to go all the way down to the database, right? Uh, so instead we return all items from the cache. So let's jump into that uh, method over here. And um, so we receive the uh, items already as a byte array. So we can easily uh, use the response writer from the HTTP uh, package in Go to return it, but we spec obviously specify the content type header to be application JSON. And the interesting thing here is we add a custom HTTP uh, response header called X surf from cache and set that to true so that we can uh, in, in a couple of seconds, when we try this app out, identify if the request was served via cache or if the, the API had to go all the way down to the database. Okay, got it. So if we go back to where we jumped into serve from cache, if the if it is if it was not a hit, so if the items weren't in the cache, then we use the persistent module and go all the way down to the database load the items, you know, marshal them into JSON. And before, you know, creating the HTTP response, we store them in the cache so that every subsequent request is able to serve from the cache. 
However, in that scenario, we set our custom HTTP uh, response header to false, identifying that this call had to go all the way down to the database. So this is a, a quick walkthrough of how uh, we load items. And let's have a look at our convenient handler to invalidate the cache. Uh, it is basically uh, calling the invalidate cache method, throwing away everything what's in the cache and returning a 204 identifying, hey, there is no content as part of mm -hmm. uh, this uh, HTTP response. So let's have one look at the cache implementation. Although we are using, or our idea is to use Azure Cache for Redis, uh, in when running in Azure, uh, we stick with the key value store API provided by the spin SDK, right? When running locally, however, uh, we aren't allowed to access the Azure Cache for Redis instance, meaning uh, when we execute the app on our local machine, we hand over taking care of key value stores to spin. So we use spin is able to uh, you know, spin up uh, a SQLite instance. Yeah. Um, so yeah, this code works uh, in both ways, right? It works locally with SQLite acting as a, a key value store, and it works online when we just reconfigure our app to interact with Redis instead. And so this is pretty straightforward API, right? We open the connection to our key value store. And in that case, the has item method just checks, hey, do you have uh, an item with the following key? If so, we say, yeah, it is a hit. If not, we say, hey, it's a miss and uh, we have to do something else. Final look at persistence. For persistence, we use the MySQL uh, module provided by the Spin SDK to interact with uh, any sort of MySQL database. And there you can see we have regular T-SQL um, that we you know, create and shoot to the database and create something or sell, in that case, select all items from the item table. Right. So with that, I would say let's move over to uh, to the terminal and let's give it a try. So in order to, to run this uh, locally, we have a Docker file in this repository uh, so that I can quickly spin up a new uh, MySQL database on my, on, on my machine. So let's do a make run uh, MySQL over here. It just builds the Docker image and we should see if we do a Docker PS, we see there is a MySQL container running right now on my machine. And it's, you know, uh, it's binding the port 3306. So we can clean this thing up again and do a, a make, uh, let's do a make build to ensure all our source code is compiled down to WebAssembly. Takes a second, there we go. Mm -hmm. And let's do a make run, which basically starts, provides the uh, connection string for the local database and starts the spin app. So there you go. So you see uh, pretty, pretty hard credentials over here, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> we end up with our app running on port 3000. So let's move to a second uh, terminal instance and let's uh, hit those endpoints. So we do a curl ixget call into the items endpoint and we get back a bunch of, uh, yeah, coffee, uh, coffee. Are, are those coffee pieces. recipes, Dustin? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the interesting thing is we see X served from cache equals to false. Yeah, but if we do this again, so let's clean the terminal, let's invoke it again. We get back the same set of data, but we see X served from, from the cache. Yeah. yeah, so we can do the, uh, the the final test. We can invalidate it. Mm -hmm. um, let me quickly cancel this one and do a curl uh, I X delete delete from the cache. We get back a two hundred four, and if we get again then we would expect this one again to be false. Yeah. 
So the idea is how could we take this app into Kubernetes and run it on top of SpinQ? So I have already uh, set my uh, Kubernetes context pointing to that AKS we saw earlier in Azure. Mm -hmm. And if we do a K get namespace, we uh, we see you know uh, several things already being deployed to that Kubernetes cluster. Yeah. So SpinCube itself dep uh, depends on cert manager for you know mm -hmm. managing or handling all the SSL certificates. Uh, and Sorry, like can, can I quick quickly jump in? I, I, I'm not. I mean, this is just a shout out for folks who might not be super familiar with what SpinCube is. Mm -hmm. um, we have done another webinar on the CNCF channel, which sort of covers the basics of SpinCube. Uh, it is a CNCF sandbox project. Um, it was uh, submitted during KubeCon uh, EU earlier this year in Paris. So if you want to deep dive and are getting started, uh, check out the other SpinCube video. We'll try and link it in the description as well. Uh, we are going to use SpinCube now, or Thorsten's going to show us how there are different parts of SpinCube, and we're going to use that to integrate your serverless WASM app into AKS. Right. Sorry, Thorsten, go ahead. Yeah, well, great addition. Yeah, uh, I think we uh, can also bring in the URL where people can uh, dive deeper into uh, into SpinCube. Um, yeah, thank you, Swan. <laughs> Um, so I have already deployed SpinCube to that cluster, right? Because we talked about that in an earlier in an earlier episode. So what I want to highlight is, okay, we have Cert Manager deployed over here. We use KWASM uh, to bring the runtime class, so container D shim for spin, to the underlying Kubernetes nodes. So this is part of SpinCube, which will be uh, replaced at. Uh, soon with this with the runtime class manager um and we have deployed the the spin operator itself which brings also two new crds to the cluster which is the spin app executor linking a setup uh, linking a spin app to the runtime you know to the runtime class so basically um allowing us to say hey if you see an an, an instance of the spin app crd then hand it over to a particular runtime class. In our case, that's container D shim uh, for for spin running on the nodes. So that that is what I've you know created or already deployed to that AKS cluster. Mm -hmm. And we have that sample namespace over here. This is basically where we will uh, deploy our app to right now. So to do so, uh, we we have to um, you know package and uh, distribute our spin app. So uh, we have a spin registry push, which allows us. So let's create a new a new tag for that one. So it was ten was the most recent one. Let's create 0011 right now. Um, so this command, by specifying the build flag, it builds again the app to ensure we have all the latest and greatest. And then it package, uh, packages the WASM module and the spin to as an OCI artifact and pushes it up into my Azure Container Registry instance. Obviously, this one requires authentication. So there's a spin registry login where you can provide credentials to authenticate the spin CLI with your whatever container registry you use. So let's uh, invoke that one. Again, it takes a couple of seconds to compile the app down to WebAssembly. And we see within a matter of seconds, we have pushed the app to the Azure container registry. From here, let me grab this thing because you don't want to see me typing that again and again. Um, I can use the spin cube scaffold command and say, hey, please go ahead and create me the Kubernetes manifests for that particular uh, OCR artifact, right? Yeah. And so um, as you can, the, sorry. This, this is um, uh, just for our audience. Um, how does the spin cube scaffold work in the sense that it is a template that you have added sorry a plugin that you have added to spin which helps right. you create the kubernetes yum right yeah 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 that's right that that's creating all the deployments man, deployment manifests required to get your spin app into kubernetes 
right? And our intention is that our story ends with those deployment manifests. So if you're cool with using kubectl to deploy uh, your, your bits and pieces, use kubectl. If you want to use GitOps, use GitOps. If you want to use Helm, you can create a Helm chart and deploy your spin apps to your Kubernetes cluster. Uh, this warning, as you can see, is obviously because I'm using a pre-release of spin. Um, so I have to upgrade to uh, the, the released version. Um, that's a task I, has, I have to <laughs> have to do. Um, so this would, if we if we would deploy it in that way, right? It would again, you know, you SQLite as a as a cache as as, as a key value store. What we want to do instead is use Azure Cache for Redis. Uh, so if we go back to VS Code for a second. There is a az.toml in my in my folder over here, which is a so-called, we call it a runtime configuration file. So we can attach configuration from the outside and uh, modify the behavior of the app. And that's uh, what we want to do, right? We want to say, hey, for, a key, for the key value store uh, with the name default, we want to use something of type Redis. And by the way, you can access Redis uh, or using TLS, that's why there are two S over here and a protocol uh, part, um, go to whatever URL the Redis cache runs at, right? So uh, LCT 2024 Redis cache Windows Net, that's the uh, FQDN for our instance of Azure cache for Redis. So we don't have to, you know, create um, necessary deployment manifests manually for, for this file. All we have to do is if we uh, wipe this thing uh, and add the C, which uh, means, hey, I want to give you a runtime config in order to, conf to create all the deployment manifests, uh, I point to my runtime config and then the kube scaffold command creates the necessary Kubernetes secrets containing the configuration file we saw earlier in VS Code and links everything together using runtime config load from secret uh, uh, on the on the spec of and that's spin. super handy, right? It saves you all the trouble of uh, doing this by hand and things. So um, yeah. yeah, just just very handy. So. That's for Redis, right? There's one piece missing. There's uh, missing the piece. The, the missing piece is how could the app right now connect to Azure MySQL instead of, you know, having an empty connection string, which would make the app fail. So uh, let me go back to VS Code and bring up the entire spin app manifest, which I customized at, at that point, right? Because I said, hey, uh, the DB connection string is already in the cluster, and uh, there is a secret called MySQL, and you can pull the connection string from the uh, connection string uh, property of that particular secret, right? Uh, there's one uh, yeah, glitch that we have to do manually right now, which will be addressed with the next release of spin operator. And that is, we have to, you know, bring in CA certificates in order to do outbound uh, connections using TLS. Um, that's why I created those volume mount, uh, volumes and the volume mounts manually. But that's something we will address soon. That that works out of the box. And besides that, there's just a runtime config and a corresponding secret for the uh, MySQL and for um, and for the Reddit, uh, for the runtime config. So providing the secret over here, convenience for the sake of demonstration, this is obviously a secret that is created maybe by the ops team and the devs. Uh, the dev team just, you know, picks up the secret when it's there. So um, yeah, mm -hmm. just to be transparent. So let's, uh, final step, let's update the uh, reference over here to uh, 0011, which we pushed a couple of uh, minutes ago. Let's go back to terminal. Let's clean this thing up again, and let's do a k apply from file point to the the deployment manifest, and say, "Hey, please deploy that to the sample namespace." What we expect to see is uh, the two secrets not being changed at all because they are already there. However, the spin app should be configured right, and I think I'm not able to type fast enough. 
um, to see. Yeah, they are already running they are because they are so tiny in size and uh, spawning those WebAssembly modules is so fast uh, that we are already on the latest version right now. So let's do a K port uh, forward to the service. Let me check. Yes, that looks good. So we are port forwarding this one and let's do, oh, no, let's cancel. Let's port forward again. Let's clean this thing and let's do a curl to the items and we get back again our list of coffee stuff already serving from the cache. All right. Mm -hmm. um, let me check. Yeah, we are still there. Let's clean this thing up. Let's do a curl, curl, delete from cache no content let's load it again we get back false in that case and let's do one more to it's see it from cache. serve it served from the cache let's check and we see all my connections are you know handled by the port forwarder so let's cancel this thing and let's verify by looking at azure Let's have a look at the, where's the cache? Where's the cache? It's easier to spot this over there. And so Azure Metrics API needs a couple of seconds to, uh, you know, bring in latest metrics, but we can see cache hits should, yeah, there are some cache hits over there. Let's go to 30 minute time frame, apply. And let's uh, let's give it a second. I think we should see the hits appearing there. Yeah, maybe it takes some time. That's weird. I think it, it does say uh, it takes a minute. I think. Yeah, it take it takes a couple yeah. of minutes. It takes a minute, but, uh, well. but yeah, we did get the cash it. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, yeah. Cool. Yeah. So that's basically. Uh, what we wanted to, to demonstrate you and to showcase, hey, you can take SpinCube, deploy it to any kind of uh, Kubernetes cluster, right? We maintain a list of supported uh, Kubernetes uh, providers, so to say, mm -hmm. on spincube.dev. Um, so this will also work with uh, Google Compute Cloud, AWS, or others providing uh, uh, providing everything that, that that you need to run full fledged applications in the cloud. Yeah, the I, I think cloud. the 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 key takeaway here, folks, is uh, Thorsten, of course, showed you how you know we first built and spin app, uh, then use SpinCube to run it on AKS specifically. But this sort of pattern is a common pattern that you will see in cloud workloads, right? Regardless of if it's in AWS or GCP or any other cloud provider of your choice, and uh, this pattern should in theory at least, work across these different cloud services. And uh, as you can see now, uh, AKS is updated and there is a cache hit. I, th I think it takes like a minute to update. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. and it was me like, okay, thinking in the meantime, why do I have to <laughs> yeah. see that? But Let's finally... throw everything, do the demo again. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but finally, the cache hit also appear in uh, the metrics browser. Yeah. Sweet. Cool. Um, yeah, I mean, just to, while we're wrapping things up, uh, spincube.dev, it is a CNCF project. It is also open source. Uh, a lot of the original code was written by companies such as Fermion, Microsoft, SUSE, and Liquid Reply. But feel free to also be a part of the community, uh, also contribute. Uh, there is a channel on the CNCF Slack as well. So if you have any questions, uh, happy to uh, answer them. Uh, Thorsten hangs out there quite often. So you know, get on there. And um, yeah, we'd love to have, have you as part of the community as well. Yeah, so from our side, thanks for tuning in and see you soon. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Cool. I can pause it and recording.